Edward was the first member of the royal family to be televised, his features used as the test card for the cameras. With a thoroughly modern monarchy, it was assumed that the coronation service would be televised. King Edward VIII was extraordinarily interested in communicating, and he saw at once that through the radio and afterwards perhaps television, this would be his best method of communicating with the people. He wanted to be the people's king. But a crowned king he was never to be. While Fleet Street was erupting with the sensation of the abdication crisis, there was no hint of it from the BBC. None of the constitutional comings and goings in Downing Street were reported. Only seven days before the final abdication did the BBC address itself to the situation. A statement by us would help to put the brake on exaggeration and listeners will be looking to us for calm news. Too calm, many people thought. The BBC's bulletins were felt to have failed the public. The quiet, dulcet tones of the announcer might have been handling a small fire for all the public knew. Sir John Reith ordered the playing of solemn music for the last two days of the crisis. The BBC was criticised for its funereal attitude and the Director General for his edict suspending normal service. The BBC, for all its royal charter, was a royal mouthpiece only at the very end. At long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. He actually chose to make his famous abdication speech on the radio, whereas other monarchs might well have been satisfied with signing the documents, and that was that. And as a matter of fact, Edward VIII really wanted to go much further in using the radio. He wanted to make a speech uh, before the abdication was decided and put his case against the cabinet case. He was egged on by Mrs. Simpson, as she was then. And she, I think, would have encouraged him to be what you might call a radio or television monarch if they'd retain the throne and if he had married her. Television prepared for the coronation. Same date, different king, said George VI. But not, it seemed, the same broadcasting arrangements. The question of television came before the meeting of the coronation joint committee. They concluded that it would be undesirable to grant facilities for the setting up in the abbey of any apparatus for this purpose. Television had to wait outside just like everyone else. Three brand new cameras were set up at Hyde Park Corner. No one was sure they would work on the day, least of all the BBC. We knew that if we flop at this, we're sunk. Awful our money will come off and we shall be considered absolute lunatics and irresponsible. If as critical as that? I think so. I think yes. it was absolutely If a critical. cable had broken down or something. Oh, my God. It's, uh, it's uh, impossible to, to think of it. Mm. And I got down to that Hyde Park Corner, I think, four in the morning. And we got everything done, and Leslie Barbrook, who was our cameraman, got under the television camera. And for the record, he took a film of exactly what the camera saw as they came forward. Those eight magnificent greys drawing on that almost unbelievable state coach with their majesties, the king and queen. Television came through its first ever outside broadcast in triumph and to the obvious relief of at least one pioneering cameraman. It was a small miracle, only 10,000 people saw it. 25 million tuned to the radio and the vivid word pictures of Tommy Woodruff. And this incredible, marvellous, coruscating, scintillating coach. And inside it, I can see through now, they've got the light on because it's a dark day, they've got the electric light on inside. I can see the king and queen, and they, they look incredible. They look like something out of a picture book. You can't believe it. It makes it all feel that we're seven years old again. I'll never forget, the very first big broadcast I had to do was with Tommy Woodruff on the return procession after the coronation. And we were in the commentary box on Constitution Hill. I can see us now 
We were fully dressed in morning coat, correct morning outfit, because Sir John Reith, as he then was, had ordained anything that's connected with the royal occasion must be, you must be royally dressed for it. So then we were walking through the crowd in our full fake morning coat to sit in a little tatty commentary box in the midst of this roaring mob. But we kept form. We, we showed that the BBC meant something. And of course it did in those days. I remember as I walked towards that commentary box and started to get into it, somebody actually came up and touched me and said, I've touched the BBC. But politics soon cast a drizzle over the enthusiasm. From the Labour benches, Clement Attlee told the House of Commons that the BBC and the press had got the whole business out of proportion. Of late years, I think there has been far too much boosting of royalty in the press and on the wireless. A reasonable pageantry now and again, well and good, but what we have had has been a fulsome adulation, the vulgar snobbery of a large section of the press, and there has been a more refined civility in other organs of the press and in the BBC. It is undesirable that the public should be indoctrinated with an entirely false idea of the importance of the throne. Despite that, the public appetite for royal events was insatiable. For the BBC, the royals were royal box office. But the more the BBC pushed at the palace, the more the palace pulled back. Any chance of His Majesty being willing to broadcast a short message? His Majesty does not wish to undertake any regional broadcasts this year. I fear there's no chance of His Majesty broadcasting on the evening of Sunday, July the, the King 2nd. has made a good many speeches on the air, and I think it's time that we drew in our horns a bit. A day in the life of the King does not appeal to His Majesty. We do not consider it desirable to have too frequent broadcasts of His Majesty's speeches and thereby cheapen the significance of such occasions. Neville Chamberlain's return from Munich and his meeting with Hitler was televised, but soon brought a frostiness between the palace and the corporation. The King's message of national thanksgiving was conveyed to the news agencies who supplied the national press. But the BBC was specifically excluded. The message was not to be broadcast. It could only be carried in print. The BBC worked itself up into a majestic huff. Memos flew. Was this a suitable reward for the BBC's tremendous efforts? What game is the palace playing? Are we not to be trusted? These conditions are intolerable. We hope the attitude of ignoring broadcasting can be cleared up. BBC management went to the palace for an explanation. A message which had taken very careful drafting should appear first in cold print, so as to avoid the possibility of listeners hearing it wrong or detecting some unintended emphasis owing to possible unconscious stress laid on parts of the message by the announcer who read it. The BBC took the point. <laughs> Meanwhile, television was in action, and here's the king. pioneering new adventures in broadcasting. In 1939, for the first time, two separate outside broadcast units covered the King and Queen's return from a royal tour of Canada. At last, television was beginning to challenge the supremacy of the cinema newsreels. But the days of television were numbered. The service was suspended for the duration. <laughs> 